Whenever there's a murder, it's the job of detectives to find out who the killer is and how they killed. And often it's forensic evidence which provides the clues. The finding of his DNA wasn't just on the murder weapon, it was on a most important part of the murder weapon. This evidence was the breakthrough that we needed. The forensic evidence in this case was crucial. In this series, we shine a light on how cutting-edge forensic techniques and the power of science brought the most dangerous killers to justice. A truly horrific criminal, a monster. It's a hammer blow. You don't know how you're going to carry on. We'll hear how some of the most disturbing crimes were solved thanks to the tiniest fragments of evidence. He basically said to me, she's in the house, go and find her. The amount of blood that was there indicated that there was a, a frenzied attack. There was no reasonable explanation for them. That's why he changed his plea. And how even the most forensically aware of killers couldn't beat the experts and hide their crimes. The key thing about having a DNA profile is you've got probably the sharpest tool in the box. I was so elated beforehand. We didn't have the evidence and all of a sudden we'd cracked it. In this episode, a young woman goes missing and a mother's instinct fears the worst. I just knew something was very wrong. A community comes together to find her. The big search racks out happened on the Saturday. Two and a half to three thousand people came from everywhere. But one man quickly arouses police suspicions. He's so nervous, I can see his heart beating through his shirt. And secondly, he's telling lies and a mountain of forensic evidence is found. And the teeth marks on the cable uh, were identical to the dog's teeth marks. This is Forensics, Catching the Killer. Around 5.15 p.m. on the night of Tuesday 9th of February 1988 when Helen McCourt was seen getting off a bus here. After stepping off the bus she would walk up up the hill around the corner and then cross over the road and then it's a very short walk to her house. But on that stormy February night 22 year old insurance clerk Helen never arrived at her home in Billinge, Merseyside where her mum was waiting for her. The last that Mary had heard from her daughter was a phone call earlier that day. Helen, she rung me up and she said, Mum, she said, I'll be home between about quarter past five and half five. She said, so you will have me tea ready, won't you? She said, and uh, I said, of course I will, Helen. And when it got to about 20, 20 to six, quarter to six, you know, and I looked and I was in the kitchen and I thought, <sighs> I wonder what's happened, maybe maybe something's happened, you know, with this wind. And the next thing was, it came over on the news about 10 to 6, saying the trains from Liverpool, Lime Street to Wigan, uh, the trains are not running because the tree had blown across the line. I, I was relaxed over that and it got to 7 o'clock and, uh, and Michael came home. Helen's brother, Michael, also lived at home. I've been working till about seven o'clock. I've come home. I knew our Helen was meant to be finishing work earlier, expecting her to be home. I've come in and my mum's asked if I've picked Helen up or I've seen her, and I just said no. I expected her to be here. The close-knit family quickly became concerned. It was totally out of character for Helen not to let anyone know her whereabouts. I knew something was wrong because Helen, if she ever missed her bus or something like that, she'd go straight to a call box and say, oh, mum, I've just missed my bus, but the next one's not due until such a time. And, and that's, that's when I, I, just, I just knew something was very wrong. 
With no phone call from her daughter, Mary became more and more desperate, calling and then visiting the train station and Helen's office in Liverpool. By 9 p.m., with still no sign of Helen, Mary reported her daughter missing. Such was her distress, police quickly escalated the case. Eddie Aldred was Detective Chief Superintendent for Merseyside Police at the time. I was having a shave and the phone rang and it was Detective Inspector John Ross who was the night Detective Inspector for the whole force. And he said to me, there's a very difficult case on, we've got a, a, missing, a girl missing from home and I'm concerned about it. I therefore went to St Helens Police Station asking the whole of the serious crime squad to meet there. Helen had been absent for a short time, so escalating the case so quickly was an unusual decision. I got some opposition from my seniors taking the whole serious crime squad to St Helens. They said missing from home. It was, it was more than a missing from home. I mean, we get a lot of missing from homes, but not when it's so... I'm coming home, I'll be home early, I'm going on a date, and then not turning up. Detectives across Merseyside were drafted onto the case in a bid to trace Helen's movements. I immediately... Uh, rang police headquarters in Liverpool and spoke to a detective chief inspector and I asked him to go to the girl's office. He was a little bit dubious. I'll send a sergeant. I said, no, I want you to go personally. He rang back within half an hour and he said to me, Helen left the office about 3.30 in company with three other people. Uh, they walked it to Lime Street Station and boarded a train to St. Helens. Helen was known to the porter at St. Helens Station. She definitely got off the train. She definitely got on a bus to Billinge. I have traced the bus driver who knew her well, she uses the bus every day, and he says she got off the bus at Billinge, outside the pub. With an eyewitness confirming Helen had arrived back in Billinge, a massive search involving 120 officers and police divers began the following morning. There was an awful lot of police activity in and around the village, house to house inquiries, they were stopping cars to retrace routes, uh, and you'd start to see it more and more in local newspapers, as well as family getting in touch, friends coming round, just everyone was getting in touch to see what was going on. Helen was popular and well known in Billinge, a village near St Helens, and had always been close to her mum, Mary. When I look back, I, I just think now what a special baby she was. She had lots of friends when she went to school. And, uh, and Michael, when he came along, it was her baby. She got to know all the neighbours and, of course, they their children were younger. And so she was booked for babysitting and the children loved her. As we both matured and left school, then we became really close. She was bubbly, she would talk to anyone. She had that ability, she was very friendly um, and she was just a happy go lucky person. She just had this infectious uh, personality with her and she was she never fell out with anybody. 
As word got out that Helen was missing, detectives questioned her family, looking for any clues that might lead them to her whereabouts. One of them was Tom Purcell, then a detective sergeant. I went to uh, Helen's house with other other officers and we spoke to Mary, her mother. Um, She gave us some background about what had happened. And during that conversation, she mentioned to us that she had some concerns about the, uh, the people in the pub, in the uh, Georgian Dragon. Landlord in there, for to buy her drinks, and, and she wasn't interested. And they were concerned that um, if something that happened around the pub, then the manager or the, or the owner may know something about it. Who was this landlord? And might he know something or have seen Helen on her way home the night she disappeared? February 1988. Police in Merseyside were searching for a missing 22-year-old woman. Helen McCourt had left work as normal, but never arrived home, sparking a huge police search. Helen was well-known and popular. The local community in the small village was shocked by her disappearance. The local media were also now across this developing story. Paddy Shannon, a journalist on the Liverpool Echo, was dispatched to the village. Billings is such a peaceful, a lovely area, a very quiet area, the sort of area that doesn't really appear in newspapers too often regarding crime stories. So it's obviously a story which really gripped this area and the concern was just off the scale. The police got the local people involved and they were out searching the local fields, parks, all the local area. We didn't really know what we were looking for at the time. Anything that had to be done, I felt it was me who had to do it. Not realising or expecting what I was potentially going to find, because you don't think of that. You just think, well, it's my sister, I'm doing it. Um, I didn't have any doubt that we'd find her. Within just a few days of Helen failing to come home, it wasn't just her family and local villagers who were on the hunt for her. The big search happened on the Saturday. And uh, we know there were, I think, two and a half to 3,000 people came from everywhere, there's coaches coming from Birmingham, they're coming from the northeast. To have that support from people, you know, people who didn't know Helen, just knew the circumstances, it's, you know, uplifting, very supportive. The whole village came to a standstill. When you think that Billings has got a population of 6,000 and nearly 3,000 people have turned out. I interviewed people on the search who were with me searching for Helen and I was just struck by um, the solidarity in the village. One person told me, I don't know, I didn't know Helen, I don't know Helen, um, but if something happens to one person in this village, we all stick together. It was during one of these interviews with local people that Paddy came across one man who had already been mentioned by Helen's family to the police. I was asked to come to Billings to try and get a bit of background information about Helen. I thought the landlady or the landlord of the Georgian Dragon might well know Helen, so that would be a good place to start. And as I was walking towards the pub, I saw this bloke parking up and then to go into the pub. And I asked him if he was the landlord of the Georgian Dragon. He said he was. I said, oh, did you know Helen McCourt? Was she one of your customers? And he said, yes, she was. And I said, would it be okay if we have a bit of a chat about her? Inside the pub, maybe. And he said, yeah. So he walked me towards the entrance. But as we got round the corner, 
I realised there were some other people waiting who wanted to speak to the landlord. There were detectives in the doorway. One of them was Tom Purcell. I was asking for uh, his account of what happened at the weekend and where he'd been. He noticed him becoming nervous as he was talking. You could see in his throat that he was, he was uh, uh, reacting with the action of his, uh, of his throat. About an hour later, Detective Inspector rang me and he said, I don't like this licensee. So I said, why? First of all, he said, I can see he's so nervous, I can see his heart beating through his shirt. And secondly, he's telling lies. He said he was here last night. We spoke to his barman and he said he was missing all night. I said, arrest him on my authority and bring him in. This licensee and landlord of the local pub was Ian Sims. And with an already suspicious alibi, he was brought in for questioning. We asked him to account for his movements the night before, the evening before. He gave an explanation that he'd been out to Southport because he was concerned about his uh, relationship with his girlfriend and his wife, about his wife finding out. So he would decide to go out to drive out to Southport to, uh, to consider his position. And then he came back to the, uh, to the pub and uh, stayed at the pub then. The police naturally went to speak to the mistress and she said, he rang me at 10 past six in a whispered voice. She got the impression that his wife was close by and she was told not to come to the pub until half past eight. So she went to the pub at half past eight. No sign of Sims, didn't appear until after 10 o'clock that night. And she noticed scratch marks on his neck and asked about these scratch marks. And Sims said they'd come about from an argument he had with his wife. But later he told the police that these scratch marks had come about from a scuffle that was taking place allegedly in the pub toilets two days before Helen went missing. So his story was just falling apart on basics of where he was and at what time. His weak alibi was just one reason police were interested in Sims. The other was his character as a man not to be messed with in the village. Ian Sims had a reputation within the pub, um, quite a violent person. Um, a lot of people were, who knew him were afraid of him. Uh, people wouldn't cross him. He saw himself as a ladies' man. Uh, there was talk of him flirting with all the young women in the pub. Um, Mary said herself that uh, there was talk of him sending drinks over for Helen at one point. It was common knowledge in the village that Ian Sims was, uh, he wasn't a nice person. And, uh, and I do know that Ian Sims kept pestering Helen and she, she just didn't like the man. There were stories, I remember Helen spoke to me in the pub and she said, I think he's a creep. Um, I, whether he made comments to her, but she was never interested in him. She wouldn't go anywhere near him. Soon, detectives received more vital evidence of Sims' movements shortly after Helen's disappearance. He was spotted by a dog walker at 5 a.m. the following morning by the Manchester Ship Canal, close to the Cheshire village of Hollins Green, some 24 kilometres from Billinge. You actually saw him with the Volkswagen car, with the boot up at the Manchester Ship Canal. And when he saw him, he slammed the boot down and got in the car and drove off. The sighting wasn't the only thing linking Sims to the site close to the canal. The following day, it was Willie's dog walking his dog again and his dog went into the undergrowth nearby and he found this blood-stained clothing and he reported it to the police. That clothing was, one of the pieces was a Labatt sweater a Blatt's t-shirt. Labatt's was on promotion in the, in, the, in the Georgian Dragon pub at the time. Uh, that clothing was taken uh, and, uh, and uh, went to forensics for examination. The next obvious step was to seize Ian Sim's car and forensically examine it. The 
Sims car, the Volkswagen car, became a centre point for an examination by forensic scientists. A big issue with the car where they were trying to find Helen's body was there was a great amount of mud and soil which they tried to trace. Sim said he'd be to Southport. They were taking forensics off his car, off his, trying to find out any dirt, any soil, any sand from Southport to prove that he had been there, that type of thing. So all those type of forensic examinations were taking place uh, as the general inquiry was, take, was going on. No breakthrough came from the mud in Sim's car, but there were other key finds to be revealed. Dr. Eric Moore from the Forensic Science Service examined the boot of the car. In the boot of the car, he found blood. In addition to the blood, he found an opal earring without the keeper on it. Showed Mary the earring, said they found this, is it Helen's? And Mary identified it as yes, you know, it's like one that uh, Helen had. In February 1988, Merseyside police were searching for 22-year-old Helen McCourt, who'd not been seen since she got off a bus just five minutes from her home in Billinge, Merseyside. Somewhere on that short walk, Helen had vanished, and despite hundreds of officers and thousands of ordinary people looking for her, she remained missing. Police had a suspect in custody, local pub landlord Ian Sims and the evidence against him was mounting. On the night Helen went missing, a member of staff um, heard noises from the flat as if there was cleaning going on in the uh, living quarters. Furniture being moved and, and cleaning being carried out. And then the next morning, the pub cleaner was um, astonished to see Sims on his hands and knees cleaning the pub and Sims explained this away by saying his dog had made a mess um, and that's why he was doing some cleaning. All lines of inquiry seemed to lead back to Ian Sims and the pub he was landlord of. Detectives knew that in order to find Helen they needed to get inside it. The inquiry was advancing quite quickly because it was only two days ago that she'd been reported missing from home and the forensic team were going to move into the pub, then do a full forensic on the pub. Um, we had to try and establish where she was, and hopefully forensics would find some evidence which would point us in the right direction. One of those involved in the forensic search was fingerprint expert Phil Gilhooley. We did the whole premises upstairs for fingerprint evidence from the entrance to the living quarters of the pub there was a, a, a door leading to the stairs which led up to the, the um, private quarters. On the banister and walls of, of that, that uh, particular area, they, they, they started finding lo quite large amounts of blood, which suggested to, to me at the time that an initial attack had taken place at the bottom of the stairs and the body had been dragged up the stairs then. To, to the living quarters. On the door of the pub, they eventually found a fingerprint, which was, to me, was almost certainly in blood. And that became a really crucial part of my, my investigations onto that fingerprint. Carpets upstairs were also examined, but the most important aspect at that particular time was the blood. Whose was this blood? Could it be Helen's? In 1988, DNA profiling was in its infancy and it wasn't available to most homicide investigations. When all the samples were taken and all the forensics at the pub were taken, they were examined at the, the forensic laboratory. Um, but we knew, obviously, there was blood samples there and the new process of DNA was being developed. It had been used a few times in court. Prior to that, if you went to a murder scene and found blood, you could probably only say it was belonged to someone with O negative and maybe break it down to a smaller group than that. Uh, but there's 7% of the population is O negative. 
Without Helen's body, it was impossible to ascertain if the blood found at the scene and in Sim's car matched hers. However, recent advances in DNA profiling meant that there was one, at the time groundbreaking, way to assess the probability that the blood was Helen's. We sought to, to, to prove that that blood came from Helen McCourt. All up the banister and all on the door, there was evidence of blood. They then decided that, uh, that they were going to take um, DNA samples from her mother and father and also her brother. And they proved by DNA, it was 14,000 to one, that it led that there was a chance that it wasn't the blood of a child of the McCourts. So we were pretty certain at that time we could demonstrate that um, the blood came from Helen McCourt. While the blood and rudimentary DNA analysis was taking place, the pub's door was removed and sent to the Fingerprint Bureau for further examination. In 1988, the process wasn't computerised and wholly relied on the expertise and trained eye of the examiner. The, the skin on, the, on your fingers and on the palms and cells of your feet is a system. It's called, we, we call it the friction ridge system, where the ridges are raised off the rest of the surface of, of the, the skin. So when a, mark, when a finger is left in a contaminant, for instance, in this case, blood, the ridges pick up the blood and when that's placed on an object, because the ridges are raised off the surface, it leaves an impression of those ridges on that, on that particular surface. In those days, we had to find uh, 16 characteristics which are in agreement on those ridges that they run roughly parallel to each other, but they deviate in, in different ways. They may split into two, they may end suddenly and that's what we term as ridge characteristics. So we have to find 16 ridge characteristics which agree in the same coincident sequence. And that, by that I mean that they're in the same position on each finger. And once, once you've found those 16 that are in agreement, then um, identity is clearly established. We already had a suspect in custody and, and it was then that the identification was formally made as to it was identical, the mark, with Sim's left forefinger. While the forensic investigations continued, yet more evidence was found, this time near Earlham, some 30 kilometres away. We know that some children out playing uh, near, near the canal had found some clothing in the woods. When that was examined by the children, they found a wallet in there, a purse in there with Helen McCourt's uh, uh, identification in it. But it wasn't just clothing that was found. Also found at the same time was some uh, cable flex. Uh, and in there was uh, hairs, which appears to be human hairs. And they were, that was sent for a forensic examination. And again, those hairs were identified as uh, Helen's, I mean, from Helen. Um, so obviously it was considered by the team that that flex, that cable flex, was properly used in the, in the death of Helen. The finding of this flex was crucial. Not only did it contain forensic evidence connecting it to Helen's body, it also bore links to a dog belonging to Ian Sims and kept at his pub. That flex then was able to be forensically examined and, and uh, linked to the cable flex that was used to tie the dog up in the pub. And the teeth marks on the cable uh, were identical to the dog's teeth marks. Back in Billinge, the forensics team were also uncovering more crucial evidence linking Helen to Sim's pub. The earring that we found, that was found in the, in the boost of the car, didn't have the keeper which locks the earring onto the ear. And we, we did a fingertip search across the carpet and the detective actually found the, amongst a thick pile carpet, he found the, the keeper of the earring, 
which was a, a tremendous found. It was quite overwhelming for me because it do, that it's a jigsaw puzzle and each piece that goes in makes it a bit more real to you and lets you know that hang on, something is wrong, maybe she's not coming back. As it sadly dawned on Helen's family that she had indeed been murdered, detectives also realised that they might never find her body. Six days after she went missing, the strong forensic evidence did provide detectives with enough to charge Sims with Helen's murder. But without her body, the case against him could be called into question in court. This was a very, very unusual case. Uh, we had a girl who was missing from home. Um, we charged the person with a murder. We hadn't found the body, but over time we got substantial, substantial forensic evidence to prove that uh, she was dead. Merseyside police knew that in order to win a case where there was no body, they needed the best lawyer they could find. I knew we needed a top man. And so I rang the chief crown prosecutor. He decided who, who got the cases. And I said to him, I want Brian Levison. He was probably the best QC in the country. In February 1988, a 22-year-old woman from Billinge, Merseyside, went missing on her way home from work. Helen McCourt was last seen getting off a bus, just five minutes from the home she lived in with her mother and brother. Despite not finding her body, detectives believed that Helen had been killed and with a mountain of evidence had charged her landlord, Ian Sims, with her murder. The trial began 12 months after Helen's disappearance and was led by one of Britain's best criminal prosecutors. All the statements and all the witnesses were important in order to build as detailed a picture as possible of what had happened to Helen McCourt. The problem then was I was presented with a series of maybe a dozen statements all dealing with individual incidents, but not necessarily in chronological order. I think for the first time in my career, I ended up on the floor of my study, literally cutting up the statements to put each into an individual section to create the same statement, but in slightly different order of events. Helen's family attended the trial at Liverpool Crown Court every day. Ian Sims was someone who Helen's brother Michael had seen regularly in the pub he ran. Now, he faced him across the courtroom. When he went to trial in Liverpool Crown Court again, parts of that were a blur. I recall most of it for me, just sitting staring at him. Um, there was that hatred there for me. Um, couldn't take my eyes off him. You just, you wanted to shout, you wanted to say something, but at the time, I quite naively thought, well, maybe with this all against him, he'll say, okay, yeah, I did it, and this is where she is, but no, he's, he'd, I think he'd convinced himself from an early time that no matter what was put in front of him, what was against him, he didn't do it, or he was never going to admit to doing it. One of the images that I presented to the jury during the course of opening was of Helen walking along the road home. Flesh, blood, hair, her clothing, her possessions. We never found her body, but we did find traces of her hair, traces of her blood, and many, if not all, almost all her possessions. In those circumstances, it was legitimate to ask the jury to 
conclude that Helen McCourt was dead. That itself was an important element of the case because without her being dead, there was no case for Ian Sims to answer. Sims gave the defence that uh, someone had stolen his car, someone has taken his clothes, and if she was killed in his pub, then they did it, and they've hidden her and brought his car back and, uh, and, and planted evidence in the pub to uh, implicate him in the charge. I couldn't believe it. It's so outlandish uh, and unbelievable um, that he expects uh, ordinary members of the public to believe that story when all the forensic evidence was totally, totally contradicted what he was saying. The jury didn't believe Ian Sims' defence either and came to a unanimous decision on the 14th of March, 1989. The jury took five and a half hours to reach their verdict. Um, but five and a half hours, I would say, is a very short time for a jury to come back um, with their guilty verdict. I could only describe it as pressure cooker for me it was just something building up and building up and then I just I just recall everyone in the court and it's like that was it it was the guilty um, and that was such a relief it was it was strange there have been but a few cases in my professional life as a barrister that have truly impinged upon me. The prosecution of Ian Sims for the murder of Helen McCourt was undeniably one of them. Helen's case is one of only a very few in British legal history to prove that a successful conviction could be obtained despite there being no body, with forensic evidence playing a key role and the trial was one of the first in the UK where DNA was used. Forensic work is detailed. It takes time. You only get one chance of finding the evidence. If you miss it, you, you don't get it. It's lost. And it can't be ever used again against anybody because it's not there. The judge remarked and said to Sims, you've been convicted on overwhelming forensic evidence. Even after Ian Sims had been sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Helen McCourt, he never revealed what he had done to her or where he had placed her body. A lot of people, after the guilty verdict, assumed that within days, weeks, he would suddenly realise that finally the game was up and he would do the decent thing, or a decent thing at last, and tell Helen's family where he had put her body. He robbed them of their daughter and then for 32 years continued to torture Helen's family by refusing to say where he'd put her. He knew that they were going out searching week in, week out in different locations in the northwest looking for her body and at no point did he come forward and put them out of their misery. It was an ongoing crime a appalling crime that started in 1988 went on for 32 years just appalling mental torture I've always said if prayer could have found Helen she'd be found by now you know I, I go to church with with Mary and I see how hard she prays you know and uh, she prays at home lights a, a candle on every Tuesday for special intention but uh, that's all that, that Mary wants, just, just get Helen back as a proper service and then laid to rest in the local churchyard. You know, everybody deserves a proper end-of-life service, whether it's, you know, just a, a straightforward cremation or religious service, you know, whatever religion or not religion you are, you deserve to have uh, a correct disposal of your, of your remains. Mary and the other members of the family have somewhere to go, you know, and uh, think about it. 
Mary fought for years to bring about Helen's law, which makes it harder for killers to be released without divulging the whereabouts of their victims' bodies. The new legislation came about just a few months too late for the McCourts, though. In February 2020, after serving a sentence of 32 years, Ian Sims was released on license, despite still refusing to reveal his secrets. He died in June 2022 and took the details of Helen's final resting place with him to his own grave. Her family still search for her body to this day. We spent the last 33, 34 years searching for Helen. That's been at the forefront of our, our lives, if you would. We're trying to do the best thing for Helen at the end of the day, that she's brought home. And when we go out searching, that's what our ultimate aim is, that Helen is found. And, you know, we can uh, lay to rest properly. Do I believe we will find her? Um, since he's died, I don't know. Can't stop searching. Um, the day you stop is the day you give up. And you can't give up. You can't. No matter how hard they search, Helen's family can never find peace from the torment of losing their girl who never made it home for her tea. For me, knowing about the pub, you find out what's happened in the pub, a lot of guilt hit me because I'd been in the pub that night and I'd asked if our Helen was there and realistically she was probably upstairs. So that's, that's what hit me a lot. Um, and it's just, I think that knocked me back because it's feelings of guilt. Guilt that you should do because I knew I couldn't do nothing about it, but guilt is still there to think, well, your sister needed you and you wasn't there. It never goes away. You know, it doesn't. Um, I, I'm going forward now because he's dead. And right up until then, I was always, always really worried going out, worried over Michael or the grandchildren. I'm, I'm 79 now, and I may not have long to go. And so I look forward to seeing Helen. I know she'll be waiting for me. <laughs>